Carl Minian. I'm a violinist. I've worked with the Dillinger Escape Plan. I've written a concerto for Rachel Barton Pine. And I play in the Vitamin String Quartet. Plus, uh, I uh, write my own stuff for my own bands and projects. Uh, I started playing music, started violin lessons when I was five. And uh, started writing music probably 20 years ago. I think something like that. 20, something along those lines. So I have always had my foot in two different worlds, almost as far back as I can remember. I've had, like my, my parents signed me up for violin lessons when I was five. So I was always, I've been steeped in Western European classical music for nearly as long as I can remember. Um, but I'm also the child of immigrants and I grew up in a working class, at the time, super Irish and Italian neighborhood um, in Eastern Queens. And all those kids growing up were into hardcore and, and metal. And uh, they were, we were all sort of part of, sort of the tail end of classic New York hardcore. Um, the stuff, like bands like Sick of It All and uh, Youth of Today, uh, Biohazard, uh, Madball, Agnostic Front, all that stuff of like, you know, the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and so I was going to shows, at, you know, in high school, going to shows at like underground, sort of like VFW halls and church basements and stuff, you know, um, and also, you know, Lamore, uh, CBs, that sort of a thing. But then also doing that, but then going to classical music school on the weekends, which was um, schizophrenic, to say the least. Danny Phillips is one of the best violinists out there. Um, he, his approach to the instrument is super, it's unparalleled, I think. He also, he's such a consummate, consummate musician that he infuses all his students with the, ability, the, 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 the questioning aspect of it, of, like getting, of delving deep into it, not just playing what's on the notes, but really finding the spirit of what, whatever piece of music we are studying. So he, I think I credit him with so much of that. I think conservatory is an interesting, uh, animal because on the one hand learning technique especially on the violin uh, learning technique on the violin is 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 a is always a great thing there's always you, you get tools that you'd be hard-pressed to find any place else however when you are in a conservatory setting like the Manus College of Music um, or any conservatory, um, you're given rules to abide by. And that can be helpful and harmful depending on where you end up going with your career, what, what moves you, what drives you as an artist. Um, it can be limiting, but also they're tools. And it, that's the biggest takeaway I think I got, that I got, I got an amazing set of tools uh, to use as I will from, from a school, from a music school. There was always this, and I can, we can speak more about an interesting, I think, race and class dichotomy there. I think part of what I do is there's not a lot of people doing what I do, and it's not because I'm like so special or anything like this. It's really the product of me having each foot in a different world. That if you look at metal and you look at punk and you look at hardcore, this kind of a thing, I think it's representative of a certain class, like a working class kind of ethic. It's like, it's like our society's folk music, right? music of the people. Um, and then when you look at classical music, you look at sort of like the sort of Western European classical tradition. Uh, that music has always had an uncomfortable but symbiotic relationship with the upper class, with the wealthy, with the super wealthy, with, the ro with royalty. And so people studying this music tend to be aspirational 
in some way, shape, or form. And I think that reflects in our society. Um, but then that's why you also don't have a lot of people doing metal on a violin. Because if you're studying the violin and you're studying Western classical music and you're going to conservatory and you didn't come up in a neighborhood like the way I came up in, like the kind of place I grew up in, you're never going to, you're never going to really want to focus on me. That's not the music that speaks to you. You want to do other things. You're, you're inevitably drawn to other things. But I grew up where I grew up and I had the friends that I had and I listened to the music that I listened to growing up. So you asked me what was my, what, what sort of music inspiration, insp you know, what kind of music inspired me or what was my inspiration. I think at my root, I've always been influenced by extreme music. It's always been there. So ever since I was like, you know, 11, 12, um, what inspires me? I think I've, I, it's, it's my, my, my music and the way I play has always been informed by those two seemingly very, very opposite and distinct strands of, of styles of music. Vitamin String Quartet is actually a collective of, uh, of string players and it's kind of headed by a record label um, called CMH, which is uh, Country Music Heritage. That's what it stands for. And uh, their original thing was uh, they would put out sort of obscure kind of, uh, kind of like historically interesting uh, records by um, pioneers of country music like the old guard, like the kind of like, maybe they have the rights to like uh, Merle Haggard's first album or like, you know what I mean? Like things like this where like, like old bluegrass, old country. And that was, so that they were like this niche label uh, based in LA and they did a one-off. It was supposed to have been a one-off in I believe 1994. So I was not a part of the Vitamin Strip Quartet then at all. Um, they did a one-off in 1994, which was like a, uh, like a Led Zeppelin tribute. And they just hired LA session players to, to, to just sort of bang it out. And uh, it was a big hit. So, and they, they needed a label to put that under. So they called it Vitamin Records, which was, you know, a, 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 a just sort of something that they came up with in the moment. And it was unexpectedly successful. So they started coming out with more of these string quartet tributes. The string quartet tribute to, to Tool, uh, Zeppelin, uh, you know, Soundgarden, whatever, all these things. And uh, so they had to come up with a name for it. So it, since it was already, you know, they already put it out as Vitamin Records, they just decided to call it Vitamin String Quartet because of iTunes. iTunes needed like that label. So as it kind of got more and more successful, they wanted live faces. So a lot of the recordings is just LA session players doing stuff, you know, recording for this label. And once they started achieving a kind of a bigger uh, level of success, they wanted live people. And so the A&R guys came to see my quartet called uh, my quartet is called Seven Sons. And that's the stuff that I did with Dillinger. Um, that's the stuff that um, Ben knows and you know, like all that stuff. And uh, they came to see a Seven Sons show. And after that recruited me and Amanda, Amanda Lowe, who was the, uh, the other violinist in Seven Sons, but also is in Vitamin String Quartet also. And they asked us to, to come out to LA, fly us out to LA and like kind of do a test run of a bunch of shows and like they threw a bunch of music at us and I guess it was an audition, kind of. And, uh, but we did, obviously we did well. So they, uh, that's how we ended up in this sort of like, I wanna say there's like eight of us in the Vitamin String Quartet. It's, you know, so there's like, there's a, there's a rotating cast. Like, so I'm a New York, I'm actually the only New York guy. Did I just hit the mic? Anyway, so I'm, uh, so I'm the only New York guy because Amanda moved to LA. Um, but they, you know, they fly me out for X, Y, and Z. And well, okay, so like I said, I have this string quartet, Seven Sons, and our sort of MO 
is a combination of music that I write, but then also music that I'm inspired by and doing uh, string quartet arrangements of. So we had done a version of uh, 43%. And on a lark, it's actually a hysterical video if you can go find it somewhere. But it's like, it was completely unplanned. Um, it was just the four of us rehearsing in my living room. And my daughter's birthday party was the night before. So there are all these pink balloons, like all over the walls. And like, you know, like Disney crap, like just kind of like, you know, like happy birthday, you know, like all this kind of shit. And we're going through 43, but it sounds pretty, pretty baller. So I posted it on Instagram just cause I was just like, you know what, fuck it. It, it sounds great. I'm just gonna post 43 and whatever. And I was expecting, you know, I was expecting like 50 likes and that's it, you know, but the thing actually really blew up like really blew up in the, in the niche uh, universe of that was, I was thousands and thousands, really thousands of likes. Um, never happened to us before. Um, and Ben saw it. So somebody brought it to the attention of Ben and then he, he PM'd me and he was just like, dude, when are you playing? And so he came down, uh, so Seven Sons had to show at um, LPR, Le Poisson Rouge and, um, Ben came down with Billy, uh, Billy Reimer, and the two of them just hung out and we kind of hit it off, like from there, me and Ben and Billy, and you know, and we just kind of like started talking and hanging out. And it was actually hilarious. He was like, do you want to jam sometime? And I was like, fuck kind of questions are you asking me, Ben? Does a fucking, does the Catholic church touch little boys? You know, so, uh, you know, so that was kind of a no brainer. And so um, we started, you know, getting together and like shooting ideas back and forth. Um, he actually started emailing me um, what ended up being uh, tracks, like uh, basic tracks to uh, Dissociation, the, the, the last Dillinger album. And so I started writing stuff to his basic tracks and we had a lot of back and forth and you know him going, I like this idea, I don't like this idea, like this, this kind of a thing. And uh, then we ended up, then Seven Sons ended up on dissociation. But beyond that, we kind of became friends just from a mutual love of fart jokes and dumb shit and pranking people and you know, uh, Actually, one prank that Ben and I did was hilarious. We did it to his sister. He, uh, he, we were hanging out one time, and he goes, uh, and he goes, isn't it weird how like you can't really when we were coming up like you could prank people, but you can't anymore because you can like. Actually, I said that to him. I was like, but you know, you can't prank anyone because everybody can see your phone number. And he goes, well, I have this app where you can like it calls from a different phone number. And I was like, dude, we don't, we totally have to like do some shit, right? Like, and he's like, he's like, let me think about it. And we're like driving and he goes, I got an idea, right? So then, so then he, he gives me his sister's phone number and then, and he's like, and like, check this out. This is the name of a Chinese restaurant like near her. So then I call her up using his app that like hides the phone number and I go, I go, uh, this will get me canceled. This is going to get me canceled, but it's not because I'm Chinese, right? So, like, I'm, I want to say that I'm Chinese so I can do this. So I call up. I'm like, hello, you are the 962 echo. I want to call to confirm your number before I, I send a talk over with the echo, right? And she just hung up. She was, like, freaked out. She hung up, you know, Ben with a deadpan face. You know, he's fucking dying inside, too, but he's just, you know, right? And so she hangs up. I call her back again. I go, you motherfucker, I have a truck waiting for you. I have a kid, I have to go to college. You better pay for a goddamn egg roll. Goddamn. You know, like, hangs up again, right? Then I call like several times. Finally, Ben's phone rings <laughs> and it's his sister being like, what are you, what are you doing? What are you, what are you, are you is, this, is this you? Is this you and your friends? And Ben's like, so deadpan, he's like, you know, I'm working here. I don't know what you're doing and you're wasting my time. <laughs> At 
this moment, my favorite project is probably the recent commission I did for Carnegie Hall, um, which is a piece I wrote called uh, The Brightest of All Possible Futures. And it was for Carnegie Hall's organiza educational organi organization called Link Up. And Link Up is, um, is attached to all the schools in the New York City public area, but also there's 119 participating orchestras nationally. And what that project was, they hired me specifically because I have this voice that does combine metal and heavy music with aspects of the, of the Western classical canon. And um, it's a five minute symphonic work with a children's choir and participating shouting from uh, the orchestra members. And so I got the lyrics by asking, the text was derived by asking third to fifth graders in the New York City public school system uh, three questions. Um, what is a problem facing the world today? How does a problem make you feel? And what positive steps do you feel you can take to address these problems? And these questions were asked at the, beginning, at the, at the height of COVID. So um, I got some really amazing answers from the kids, so which also just reminded me to not underestimate children that they really, you know, they sh they should be taken seriously. And uh, they, uh, their text was super on the point, on point. And I just took their text and I set it to, to music. And um, it was performed, because of COVID, it did not get the Carnegie Hall uh, uh, debut that it was supposed to get, but rather it was performed live by Auckland Philharmonia in New Zealand because they were the ones at that point in time that didn't fuck up their COVID uh, response, unlike pretty much the whole rest of the world. So they had a working, they, they were all, everybody was working. Um, their COVID rate was pretty much zero at the time. And they uh, performed, they had two performances of the work. And I was, really pleased and I th that's the thing I'm most proud of so far and since things are opening up now at the time of this uh, at the time of this filming it's, it's starting to open up so the 119 orchestras in the United States are slated to pick up this work so I find that super exciting also and we'll see where it goes from there but I am very proud of that work and in that sense, it was, because it was a super collaborative affair too. I mean, the, the, the children coming up with that text was really what drove a lot of the music that I wrote. No one really knows what, you, you only can do the best you can do and what kind of speaks to you as an artist or a musician and whatever other people take away from it um, that's beyond your control, right? So I can't necessarily say what I hope to see from the younger generation. But what I do like that I am seeing in the younger generation is a less of a divide in terms of these styles or these genres. I think that those borders are going away. And I think I'm really into that. I really, because as when I was growing up, I was definitely the oddball for sure that like I said, I had these two each foot in very different worlds that like I was, you know, I would, you know, I would see, I would see a band, I would see like Typo or something, like on one night and then go to, um, to violin school the next morning and it was like completely separate. There was nobody I knew who was like into the same things I was into or well, like if I was playing a Metallica solo on my violin or something, like people would look at me like I was like crazy, like legit, what are you doing? Like this is unheard of and frowned, really, really frowned upon. And so there was not a lot of openness when I was coming up in terms of embracing different styles of music, in, in, in terms of what 
a violinist or a string player should be studying and playing. And I'm seeing those borders become way more porous with the younger generation, with the, with the kids coming up. I definitely see a lot more flexibility and I love it. So if I could be an example of that in a small, tiny way, I think that would be amazing. That's super cool. That, that's the kind of stuff that would make me really happy. Um, of course, you have, I have no way of knowing, but that's, that's what would really excite me, seeing, seeing kids being like, yo, you know, like that's, he, he, has, he, has this, he has this training in Western classical music, but he's using it to do like other things. It's not just, there's the, the, we understand the rules and there is a parameter, but we can leave the parameters when we want. We can be in the parameters when we want and we can ignore them as we wish. There's, I don't feel burdened by these rules. So I'm gonna play a song called Yama, uh, which was originally written for my metal band uh, called Resolution 15. Um, I wrote this, God. I don't, know how many, I don't want to say how many years ago. It's probably 10 now, something like this. Um, we wrote, it's the, the subject matter is uh, lyrically, which you're not gonna hear because it's just me doing the riffs. Um, but the, lyrically, the subject matter is Yama, the god of death in, um, in the Hindu canon and the Buddhist canon. And we're just sort of saying, that a lot of the things that people tend to kind of uh, focus on is sort of irrelevant. Things like status, um, where your, your, your ambitions, your, all that stuff is sort of like, it all butts up against the face of death. So like that's the non-negotiable in everyone's lives. So that's kind of lyrically what we're going for. And of course, musically, we try to uh, resonate with those also. So you're hearing a musical representation also of that inevitability. Thank <laughs> you. 